Hello and welcome to Montclair State University. I'm Keith Strudler and I'm the Director of the School of Communication and Media and I'm thrilled to have you all here for tonight for what will be a remarkable and meaningful evening. Tonight we will collectively address some of the most critical social constructs of our time. The intersection of racial justice, media, and art. A space that takes us from the powerful work of Kara Walker to today's hashtag movements on social media that bring a democratized voice to the hopeful gates of change. Through the collaborative work of Montclair School of Communication and Media and the Montclair Art Museum, tonight we recognize the continuum of messaging from canvas to film to smartphone and their potential to make us think, to connect, and to perhaps to work towards a greater good. Now, I will admit that when we first conceived this partnership and this event, we planned to host it in our spectacular new School of Communication and Media facility just across the way. But as interests continue to grow amongst our many communities, we knew we'd need to move to a larger and equally spectacular venue. That said, for those who have not yet visited our school, please accept a personal rain check to come visit any of our future events, lectures, and productions. Please come here as speaker, watch a newscast, observe filmmakers in action, and see what happens when you place smart young minds with an inspiring faculty in a truly world-class learning facility. The School of Communication and Media at Montclair State sits at the cutting edge of instruction and technology and helps educate the next generation of socially responsible practitioners that we hope will follow in the lofty footsteps of those you'll see on this stage in just a moment. We are very proud at the school to not only produce gifted and ethical professionals, but also critical thinkers who currency and conversations just like these. And since we're talking about hashtags, don't forget to be a part of our Twitter conversation this evening using the hashtag Racial Justice Montclair, which you will soon see up on the screen. Now, special evenings like this don't happen without the effort and support of a lot of people. So before we move ahead of our, with our program, it is my privilege to say a few thank yous. Some of these names you're actually going to hear again from my partner, Laura Urbanelli of the Montclair Art Museum. And that's simply because when you bring two great social institutions, like the School of Communication and Media and the Montclair Art Museum together, there are people who are essential in both our worlds. And Laura and I would be remiss without both saying thanks. So with apologies for both redundancy and to those I've inadvertently forgotten, let me thank Frank Walter, who kick-started this. <laughs> and guided this process, as well as Jim Leitner, Sharon Taylor for their support, Terry Tang, Carol Bogart. There's a lot of thanks <laughs> of the Marshall Project. Your collective input has been invaluable. We have an amazing team here at the university that's worked tirelessly to make sure I always looked like I knew exactly what I was doing, which is not always an easy task. Um, a lot of lunches I need to be, uh, to be buying over the next, next few weeks. Um, and that includes a lot of our faculty and staff in the school, including, but certainly not limited to, Mark Efron, Stuart McClellan, Tara Conley, and our tireless, and Tara Conley, excuse me, and our tireless and fearless associate director, Christine Lamessiano and our school administrator, Deborah Dykeman. Big thanks to everyone in broadcast media operations, including Patty Perot and Adam Goldberg. Thanks to College of the Arts Dean Dan Gerskus for his support of this project, and President Susan Cole for her unwavering support of our school. And thanks to everyone at Kasser for making this beautiful space happen. A huge thanks to the Montclair Art Museum and its talented director, Laura Urbanelli, for her partnership on this and future projects. And of course, thank you to our gifted speakers, Soledad, Joy, Kai, and Jim who are as gracious as they are talented. Tonight is a special night, so to all of you who've made this possible and to all of you who've come together for this conversation, thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my partner on this event, the director of the Montclair Art Museum, Laura Urbanelli. Thank you, Keith. Welcome, everybody. What a great hall. Um, I, too, want to thank so many people, but I want to start by just talking about the important partnership between Montclair State University and the Montclair Art Museum. You know, in a town with so many creative and intellectual resources, it's natural that these two major organizations uh, would find ways to bring people together to intersect on many rich topics. Tonight's panel began, as you heard, with um, a great idea from Frank Walter, known in both organizations as a passionate supporter and connector. And Keith and I are both so grateful for that guiding energy. But it's the arts that really crystallized this project for us uh, and this discussion tonight. 
uh, in an area that is already richly fueled by current events. Across town at the Montclair Art Museum, we currently have focused nearly every gallery around resonant social justice issues of the day as soon through the, seen through the eyes of visual artists. Featured among them, of course, is the art of Kara Walker, whose work is both subtle but horrifically demanding in what she requires of her viewers. Drawing upon both artistic and historic precedents, her murals, prints, drawings, and videos leave no question in your mind when you see them about racial injustices past and present. The main focal point of our exhibition, a 40-foot cut paper silhouette entitled Virginia's Lynch Mob from 1998, is now a signature masterwork in the Montclair Art Museum collection. It's contextualized with works in a mini retrospective, and the show is on through January 6th, so I hope you will have a chance to come up and see it. Uh, in addition to the Kara Walker exhibition, our permanent collection has been also rehung in an exhibition entitled Constructing Identity in America, 1766 to 2017. Um, please take advantage of the opportunity to see so much compelling and thoughtful work on view in your neighborhood. Uh, it's not something that everyone can boast of in their neighborhood art museum. But for over 100 years, the Montclair Art Museum has been a cultural hub in this community. We pride ourselves on being a focus uh, in the community for conversations through the arts about revel uh, relevant topics of the day, and we provide broad educational services connecting the arts to our everyday lives, whether you uh, have toddlers in your family, are a senior, or at any stage in between. So like Keith, I want to say a few words of thanks. I cannot but thank Jim Leitner and Sharon Taylor, two wonderful board members at MAM who have also helped pull this evening together, Carol Bogart, Terry Tang, all the panelists, MSU, Susan Cole, and Keith Strudler for all he has moved heaven and earth to get us to this point. And I also want to thank our veterans, uh, both here tonight and out in the community. Uh, it is that time of year when we need to stop and pay attention to all that you've done for all of us. And with that, it's my privilege to present from Kara Walker to Colin Kaepernick, Racial Justice Through Media and Art. Thank you again. The exhibition, Virginia's Lynch Mob at the Montclair Art Museum, is designed to make you uncomfortable. Kara's work is very provocative, which confronts you with the history of racial injustice in this country. She shows images that are very stereotyped. She does that on purpose. And through those stereotypes, which she condenses in this fantastic historical silhouette medium, um, she tells a story about the way that we categorize our ourselves, the way that we related through history, and very quickly sets up a power dynamic that is, is very black and white, and that pun is intended for her. Her point is to make you think very hard about not just what went on in the past, 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 but what's happening today. When you talk about issues like Charlottesville, Kara's work directly relates to those kinds of current day issues through this historical context. Breaking news from Charlottesville, Virginia. You're looking at live pictures out of Charlottesville, Virginia. All of a sudden, you heard the screech of tires. <laughs> One person is dead and 19 injured after a speeding vehicle drove into a group of protesters. Kara Walker's work has been very similarly presented for 25 years, but over those years, we have had a lot of activity that has made this very, very much a current moment. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. When there's significant change and I feel like that flag represents what it's supposed to represent, I'll stand. They're wrestling right in the back of I'm my pretty sure the guy's dead out here. Holy Shots were fired and Brown went down. I think all the works in this show speak to social justice. The arts are a communication tool just like a 
a social media platform is a communication tool. It's important to understand that just like anyone who's tweeting on social media, this is one artist's voice, this is one artist's reaction. And like all artists, their reaction hopefully connects to something in you that incites your own reaction. I have a dream. A Trayvon Martin could have been me. Me as a woman of color, I feel vulnerable to certain behaviors. The United States is not the black man's country. Definitely. American laws no, are not. There are very few African American men who haven't had the experience of being followed like in their people shopping. People of color are under attack. The uh, laws here in America were made white by white people for the benefit of white people. Good evening. Yes. <laughs> I'm Tara Conley, Assistant Professor in the School of Communication and Media here at Montclair State. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's event. Last Thursday, I had a chance to see Carol Walker's exhibit at the Montclair Museum of Art. Now, this was the first time I'd seen this particular exhibit. I was actually meeting uh, James Johnson, our moderator, to go over uh, tonight's event. As I walk parallel along the curved wall along which Virginia lynch mob marches, James says to me, where are you? Now granted, he might have actually asked me, Tara, what do you think of the exhibit? But what I heard was, Tara, where are you? Though my body was present on the second floor of the museum, my mind was elsewhere. Looking at Walker's Virginia Lynch mob and listening to the sounds of her caravan transported me back to September 2005, two weeks after Hurricane Katrina. Seeing news clips of black American citizens waiting to be rescued from rooftops, walking across bridges with blistered feet, sprawled out along the periphery of American sports arenas. Now, I know white survivors of Katrina suffered too. But indelible in my mind are the images of black, Katrina's black survivors. Indelible in my mind is the hypervisibility of black suffering set against the American imagination. Back in the museum, along the wall of the Virginia Lynch mob depicts what appears to be, at least phenotypically, a white child holding a toy gun. Next to him is a black child holding a rifle in his mouth. A black blotch of paint appears to shoot from the, black, the back of the black child's head. It looks to be his brains. I told James, that's Tamir Rice. Tamir couldn't play with a toy gun. He couldn't be an imperfect child. They shot him dead. Tamir, unlike the white child depicted in, Walk in Walker's lynch mob, never got a chance to play, I said. Now I'm transported to 2014 in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. This was two years after Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida. Five months after Eric Gardner was killed by a police officer in Staten Island. Four months after Mike Brown was killed by a police officer in Ferguson. And one month after Tamir Rice was shot by a police officer in front of a gazebo. I was downtown Cleveland, standing side by side with local protesters. They shouted, fists up, don't shoot. I joined them chanting out loud in the name of Tamir and others, fists up, don't shoot. Four months before in Ferguson, protesters were putting their hands up. But by time the movement had reached Cleveland, we were putting our fists up. If black life in America were a painting, it would look like a series of bodies and gestures expressing pain and joy on a canvas of colonization, reconstruction, Jim Crow, and white supremacy. So of course, it makes sense that in 2016, Colin Kaepernick took a knee in American sports arena to, pr to protest racial injustices against black Americans. He, like many others who came before him, kneeled as a sign to signal us to stop, to slow America down. Cap compelled us to consider not just the expendability of black life, but also, and most importantly, 
the humanity of black life. But how do we slow down? How do we allow ourselves time to process our history and to, and to connect to the stories of our lives? How do we do this in today's media and technological landscape? What questions must we ask about representation and dissemination? How do we get to the matter of black life in ways that are not diminished on social media and watered down by sound bites and talking points? Perhaps we can start by asking, what does the matter of black life sound like? What does the matter of black life feel like? What does the matter of black life look like in a world where all we want is joy? When you arrive on the second floor of the Montclair Museum of Art, you're greeted by Kara Walker's words printed on the wall. She makes it plain, quote, the work is difficult because the history is hard, end quote. Now tonight, it is my hope that you all leave heavy, but heavy in the sense that allows you to feel both the pain and the joy of our history, and in the sense that you are weighed down by more questions. I look to our esteemed panel tonight to guide our thinking so that we can see what Kara Walker's work inspires us to reckon with. And that is the humanity of black life in America. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. We are truly blessed tonight to have four remarkable figures to offer their expert perspective, analysis, and provide context and meaning. These four individuals are, simply put, four of the most thoughtful, experienced, and important voices of our time, and we are all privileged to have them here together. So it is my distinct honor to introduce a legendary award-winning journalist with the world's most acclaimed networks, current host of Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien, correspondent with HBO's Real Sports, CEO of Starfish Media Group, founder of multiple documentary series, including Black in America and Latino in America, and Harvard Distinguished Fellow, Soledad O'Brien. Oh, it's one of the things I'm good at. Uh, <laughs> so, um, next, political analyst for MSNBC, host of MSNBC's AM Joy, and a fixture in the network's evening lineup. Author of the book, Fracture, Barack, Barack Obama, the Clintons, and the Racial Divide, a fellow at the Knight Center for Specialized Journalism, and simply one of the nation's most important and educated voices on progressive politics, Joy Reid. Next, the host of WNYC's narrative unit and groundbreaking shows, There Goes the Neighborhood and United States of Anxiety, a columnist for the nation, the former editorial director of Color Lines, and author of Drifting Towards Love, Black, Brown, Gay, and Coming of Age on the Streets of New York, Kai Wright. And finally, our moderator, a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Social Justice and its longest serving chair, architect for the revival of Atlantic City under Governor Phil Murphy, former Undersecretary of the Treasury for Enforcement for President Bill Clinton, and former candidate for Governor of New Jersey, lawyer, activist, and supporter of the arts, born and raised in Montclair, New Jersey, Jim Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, I present tonight's esteemed panel. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everyone. All right, we're family here. We can do that. <laughs> the, um, it is really wonderful to be here, and really wonderful to be here with this panel, which um, I probably had the best weekend of all of us because I spent it 
listening to them, <laughs> reading them, <laughs> watching them. Uh, they're really, really phenomenal. So we had a plan um, about how we were going to cover the day. And then I was listening to Tara's talk. And in the green room, we started to talk about our first impressions of um, the work of Kara Walker. And what, since we are grounding this in art, and we're going to be talking about art and social change and media and social change, um, we will end up talking about a little bit about the impressions of various works of, um, by Kara Walker. But we're going to start with why they are here, why they're doing what they do, and how they do it. What do I mean by that? Um, if you have watched them or listened to them as I have, you know that they bring to the task of journalism a distinctive point of view, um, extraordinary preparation, curiosity, and passion. Um, and I know we have s some students here who are interested in journalism, they're interested in communications, and others who are just, um, they just like to hang with journalists. And so what we wanted to do is really start uh, with you, Soledad, talking about, you know, what story in particular, it doesn't have to be a big one, um, that helps shape your current point of view um, and the way you take on the task right now. Sure. Um, I would say, if I can say two, the first was uh, in 2005 covering Hurricane Katrina because I think it was the first time as a reporter that I actually felt that I was doing what a reporter is supposed to do, which is to serve the public. Um, we uh, got into the city after the first week, and I remember we would sort of transition every couple of months out, so I'd swap with my co-anchor. And after sort of being embedded for two months, I was leaving, and I remember we got a standing ovation at the um, Baton Rouge Airport because people, like, we, we were accomplishing a service. We were helping people find loved ones. We were asking tough questions. We were pushing officials. And I remember thinking, like, oh, my gosh, this is actually why I signed up for this. This is kind of what I'd always hoped to do, to, to do some meaningful reporting. Fast forward a couple of years, we did a documentary series called Black in America, and it would go on to have nine years of doing that, and then uh, a couple of years in, we started doing Latino in America. And I think that was another um, piece of reporting that certainly for to show people that not only there were obviously lots of interesting, amazing, incredible stories that you could do about African Americans, um, more importantly for me was the sort of flip side of it, sort of the reaction at CNN, how hard it was to get it done, what a miserable experience it was in a lot of ways to like fight every single, you know, at some point you're like, you fight every day, you're like, I'm so tired of fight, you just go in and have an easy day, can I just, just, uh, you know, so there was so much that was so crazy about doing that documentary series to try to get stories on. I rem and I'll leave you with just what, one line and we can talk more about it later, which was when the executive said to me, don't make it too black. <laughs> it's called black in America. <laughs> and, but, but it really, I understand, right, the whole point was, you know, what we don't remember, the entire goal is not to alienate what is CNN's majority audience, which was a white audience. And, you know, of course, by then I'd been in TV long enough to be like, gotcha, no problem. <laughs> like, not a problem at all. Um, no fist bump? It, it, no, no. That was pre-fist bump, <laughs> pre the Obama fist bump, um, terrorist fist bump, I guess it was uh, at some point. So, you know, just constantly recognizing that um, these conversations were so fraught, like getting stories on about African Americans and Latinos was just so much harder than I think anybody in the audience would ever believe. And to get them on in a way that was thoughtful and um, well researched and just nuanced and gave people humanity, um, all those things, it was just really, 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 really hard. And I think um, kind of living through that has brought me to where I am now where, you know, I just feel very comfortable with sort of saying what I want to say on social media, doing what I want to do in the production company I run, uh, and asking the questions I want to ask when I'm anchoring a, a show. I just, I think you get a little fearless. Fearlessness is good. Joy. Yeah. Um, thank you all. First of all, thank you, Mark Sarah Staple. And thank you to you, Jen. Thank you to my shout outs to Omnika Thompson, my friend and former EP <laughs> who invited me here. Um, we've been through some of those stories together, so Omnika and I could really 
we could sit with Soli and Soledad and have an, an, an interesting conversation. I love about that you call me Soli. All my friends call me Soli <laughs> from, from high school. That's how they're, yeah. Well, I, I love want it to be Soledad yes, O'Brien when I grow love up. Love it. So. <laughs> um, so There's going to be an after party. So there we can should do that. be. There right. should be. Well, Black in America influenced a lot of us. It influenced me. And as somebody who came really from opinion journalism, I did digital at a local NBC affiliate in Miami, but I went straight to, into opinion after that as a columnist doing talk radio. So I was an opinion person um, when I came to came back to NBC on the network side in 2011. And so I would say the story that for me was the biggest eye opener in terms of a lot of the things that Soledad talked about and just in terms of um, doing sort of out there in the world beat journalism really kind of for the first time being thrown into it was the Trayvon Martin case. Um, it kind of, um, one of our interns at the Grio, which at the time was owned by NBC, and it was a black facing digital property um, of NBC, of first NBC News and then later MSNBC, which took it over. Um, and so we had some of this, a lot of the same challenges. Um, it was a challenge for me as just a person um, with three children, two boys, one of whom was exactly Trayvon Martin's age. Mm -hmm. Um, as somebody who had lived in Florida for 14 years, both my sons were born there. My daughter was born in Brooklyn, but she moved there when she was two. So basically, I'd raised my children in Florida. Um, so I really understood that, um, that environment. And so that, you know, the kind of suburban environment that Trayvon Martin came from, he really wasn't from Sanford. He was actually from South Florida in a town I knew really well. It was a town just adjacent to the one I raised my kids in. Um, Miami Gardens is the largest um, black enclave, black suburban en enclave in Florida outside of Jacksonville. It was a town with a black mayor, this dynamic, incredible person. Um, Trayvon Martin, you know, far from the way he was being portrayed in media, um, was a suburban kid who rode horses, um, who participated in an organization called Experience, Experience Aviation, which was known to the country for its founder, Barrington Irving, being the first African-American to circum <clears throat> circumnavigate the globe. He'd flown in a, an airplane around the entire circumference of the earth and then founded this incredible aviation organization that kids who wanted to be pilots, including Trayvon Martin, were a part of. You know, this is a kid who's, you know, riding horses and flying simulators. But I'm watching as he's being portrayed as this demon who, for whatever reason, when followed by a stranger, jumped into the bushes and leapt out at the stranger to attack him and then use sort of cartoon villain lingo to pummel this MMA fighting uh, wannabe police officer who'd, who'd been turfed out of the police academy, who'd been a bouncer, who'd previously abused his girlfriends. And nobody knew any of those things. And we were being told Just that one the quick thing, MMA, mm, that's mixed martial arts. Mixed right? martial arts. This guy right. had been studying mixed martial arts. I mean, right. he, he pudged out for the trial, mm -hmm. right? You know, most people try to slim down, as I am doing right now. He pudged out. He was like, let me stop working out and try to look really soft and really dainty because I'm about to go on trial. You know, you watch. So I'm watching this whole trial take place, having pretty much moved to Sanford for a couple of months to report on the story um, and living in... Um, a little hotel near the Walmart, not the fancy hotels where most of the journalists were living. I was like in Sanford by the Walmart. And just the story of Sanford, you know, having been a deeply segregated city that forcibly annexed the black part of that town uh, in order to increase their census numbers, but wouldn't allow the African American residents of Sanford to eat in the restaurants on the white side of Sanford, and who wouldn't allow uh, you know, Jackie Robinson to um, even be in the white side of town to practice. And he had to stay in homes on the black side of town where every single black person had a gun because the Klan would regularly march across the train tracks and threaten the white the black residents. So this was a, a town with a, a horrific history of segregation and racism where then this boy who was a stranger to them comes to visit his dad and gets murdered, followed, stalked, and killed. And that's the narrative that I saw as a journalist and whereas the country was being fed the opposite narrative, that he wasn't even a boy, he was not even portrayed as a child, he was my child's age. So it was one of those instances where you realize that being black in journalism meant you had to bring a perspective to the table that was alien to everybody else at the table and that you had to force the narrative to be a part of it because they already had drunk in the police narrative because that's the official narrative. And this guy who was a wannabe cop, who was friendly with the police, was acting as a wannabe police officer, was being treated the way a police officer is treated when he shoots someone. So that story was very hard to do in the sense that you were kind of swimming uphill. You were swimming against the tide. You don't swim uphill. 
because there's no, you can tell I'm tired and sleep deprived. <laughs> it's upstream. You can I was swim swimming upstream, upstream right. running uphill. <laughs> you can run uphill. And yeah. all of the narrative. You can swim uphill. You can, no, you can swim like uphill. Like That's can. true. I could do anything. I feel like you I could swim uphill if I want to. Yes, I'm a strong black woman. I'll swim uphill if I want to. Um, <laughs> but um, it was a difficult story to do emotionally to keep enough distance where I could still speak on the phone pretty much every day with George Zimmerman's attorney, where I would still get, keep him taking my phone calls, where I had to present a balanced narrative <clears throat> um, that was fair and accurate and true, but that also took into account the humanity of Trayvon Martin. And it's not easy to do that in a corporate environment, being constantly questioned um, in terms of whether standards thought we were being solicitous enough to the, to the Zimmerman defense. It was tough, it was difficult, but it was a story that you know shaped me as a journalist um, and I thought was important to tell and that I was very proud of the way we at the GRIO told it. Kai. Okay. Uh, trusting, building, trusting yourself in your narrative, I think, is an important part of, for me as well. And also thank you for having me here and thank you to, uh, uh, to Tara Connolly for her opening remarks. That was my former colleague at Race Forward. I don't see Tara out there now, but I, you know, there, I learned both the positive and negative um, lessons about narrative. Um, uh, I think in uh, in covering the foreclosure crisis is where, where I would I would I would drill down. I can remember it was must have it was probably late 2006, early 2007, and I was at a wedding. Um, I'm from Indiana, and I was at a wedding uh, of a white um, high school classmate, uh, and uh, we were just standing around talking, and it was, you know, he was white, so the whole wedding was white, <laughs> and, um, uh, and everybody was so bullish. They were all like, oh, and times are great. Money's falling from the sky, isn't it? Isn't it? It's great out here. The property's great. Money's, and I was, and it was weird, and I was like, what are you guys talking about? Because... In my life, you know, my mother had just lost her house. You know, I, everywhere I looked in my community and in the other stories, I was all of my reporting is, is in the, is, most of it is in the black community. Uh, and I had, so I had been talking to people about their lives and I, all I saw was crisis. I had seen crisis since 2001. Black community had never come out of the recession, out of the 2001 recession. So I had spent the last several years in this, you know, seeing a narrative that was like, the house is on fire, trouble is coming, debt has been piling up, you know, and those folks went from credit card debt to payday loans, and now they're getting these subprime loans and people are starting to lose their houses and this is gonna be a crisis. And no one else, most everybody else thought it was, was boom times. And, um, and, uh, and that, was a, that, that was a moment to say, oh, I need to, to trust the world I see um, and begin to report this story. Um, and as a consequence was on the front end of reporting what became the, the, the story of, of the crash, which was the fact that they had given all of these, sub they, had, they had sold all of these terrible loans to black people who had been in crisis for five years. And so also I understood the actual longer narrative of it when the crisis came. It wasn't just, um, Oh, you know, these people bought got too many. These people bought too much house. You understood that the the loan <laughs> choice followed the payday loan choice followed the credit card loan choice because I had watched all of those. Um, and so, I, and I think throughout my career, it's been about trusting the world that I see around me, trusting the black community that I am part of, uh, to follow the story. Um, uh, those are sources that are not taken seriously until they become victims to to mainstream media until it's something that everybody wants to talk about. But, but, but if we, it, I have tried to spend time talking to folks before uh, it becomes uh, a large story and as a consequence, hopefully leading my colleagues to see that if we focus there, we might be able to prevent some of these crises. But the flip side, I think I also have to say on narratives is that in the course of covering the foreclosure crisis is also learning to, to shut up and listen sometimes is something I'm trying to be mindful of now as a journalist. Uh, I will never forgive myself sitting, I was in Jacksonville uh, f f doing a story about um, mortgage servicing, you know, and how 
uh, how crappy the mortgage servicers were. Um, uh, a very wonky story that I was certain was very important and I was going to tell. And I was sitting across from this lawyer who was trying to solve people's, and they have, they have judicial foreclosure in, 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 in Florida. So there was a lawyer trying to come up with the strategy to gum up these foreclosures. And she kept saying, you know, they've got these documents. They're all signed by the same person. There's thousands of documents signed by the same person who could not possibly have been in the same places. Look at these documents. She's got this stack of papers. And I'm like, lady, look, that's not the story I'm here for. <laughs> I, you got this stack of papers, and I don't know what you're talking about, and you sound a little conspiratorial. This is about mortgage servicers, and that's what I'm here to tell. That's the narrative <laughs> I know, and I'm going to tell it. And that was a year before that story broke. You know, uh, and I, you know, both as a journalist who wants to break the story, but also like as if, if the purpose of my work is to try to bring truth and drive towards justice. Uh, uh, I, because of my hubris and thinking that I knew what I was there to get, I missed the most important story of the of the Christ. So I'm trying to hold both of those lessons now in this moment. You know. Um, how to trust the community I'm in and trust the world I see in those trends, even if they sound crazy to everybody else, uh, and how to nonetheless <laughs> be listening uh, and listening intently is because that's the job. <clears throat> so all, all three of you have talked about narrative and in various degrees talked about having to push against something to get the narrative out. Um, you all work now in very different um, contexts. Um, and so I thought that maybe, Joy, if you could talk about your efforts in the corporate context, and then Kai moving on to sort of WNYC in the nation, and then your name is on the door. You run the show. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is, what's it like in this now different world for you? Um, Joy? Okay, uh, this is all off the record, right? <laughs> yeah. These are a lot of people have There's their nobody iPhones. Here nobody else is here. This is us on the stage talking. She's recording on her phone. Okay, okay. She's recording on her phone. <clears throat> well, I mean, I, it, it's. <laughs> can, journalists, can journalists go off the record? I think my boss is here. Is your boss here? Okay, so you should go first then. Okay, well, so I, I you know, the core, you have to re realize that. Um, the companies that we work for, uh, other than Soledad, I was lucky enough to be the boss of the company, you know, their, um, their mandate is different from the individual journalist's mandate, right? I work for a company whose main principal mandate is to get you to sign up for cable and to stay signed up for cable, right? That's really what the, the main boss of our company, I used to, we used to be GE, whose mandate was for you to buy light bulbs and uh, fighter pilot, uh, fighter jets, right? They were selling like, aircraft carriers and light bulbs. So Mine's that's parked out back. So yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's what the company's job is. Um, and then in addition to that, and this is somebody that I work with said this about Twitter, and I think it's also true about television. In w when you use Twitter or you use Facebook, you think of yourself as the customer and you are Twitter's customer. You're not Twitter's customer, you're Twitter's product, right? Because what they're selling is how many of you are using Twitter. That's how they make money. You're not their customer at all. So your orientation toward them is wrong. The way you're thinking of your relationship to them is wrong. It's the same thing with television. You are the product. We want more of you, because the more of you that are viewing our product, the more you know, soap we can sell. And that's how we make money. And so for the journalist, you're in a completely opposite orientation toward the viewer than the company is. Our goal, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, is simply to inform you, you are the customer. So we see you as the customer and the people we work for see you as a product. So those things can be intention. Uh, in addition to that, because the company, and I think Soledad touched on this, wants as broad a product, ba a broad a um, product base as possible. They want lots and lots and lots of viewers. There's a constant concern that we don't want to offend this piece of our, of our viewer base. We want to make sure that everybody's happy and that we're kind of being as bland as we can so that we can sell to as broad a community base as we can. So that if you're, the truth you're telling is controversial, your corporation might not like to hear that. They may not want that. Um, and then the other thing I think we have to come up against is that these institutions trust other institutions, sometimes more than they trust individual journalists. So for instance, uh, in the case of, of Tamir Rice, I can recall having uh, you know, some struggles. You know, Nika's gonna smile because she, she knows about this. Some struggles with trying to get the corporation to understand that we may not trust the institutional narrative about what happened to Tamir Rice. 
that because the institution, the police are saying, you can't say that we treated Tamir Rice's sister in this way, but we can see with our eyes looking at the tape of what happened when the sister gets tackled to the ground, that their narrative isn't true. So now your intention, because the corporation wants you to go with the institutional narrative, it's safer, but we are saying that that institutional narrative is wrong. So you end up in a lot of situations. I mean, I remember even during the Trayvon Martin story, having information about George Zimmerman's alleged abuse of his sister and having it early, but having the company be reticent to put it out there because, well, we, we want to make sure we feel safer when other journalistic organizations also put it out there. So even they would rather have the safety than the scoop. So, and this is the kind of thing that happens when you work for a corporation. They have just a very different set of goals and a very different set of parameters than what you have as an individual journalist. You want to get the story out there as accurately as possible, uh, as fully as possible, but you aren't worried that the truth is going to offend a piece of the audience because that's not your job, right? That's not what you're supposed to care about. So it can be challenging. Sometimes, you know, you, you wish, uh, and even I think even Vice News people probably confront it to a certain extent, that because they're smaller and less institutional and they're not selling cable subscriptions, they have even wider latitude. So you're seeing this kind of stratification of journalism where the institutional actors are telling a very safe story and the further and further you get out from the institution, the more, I think the more truth that you're getting um, whether you know everyone believes it or not, but I think that it, it, it's good that there are more narratives than just the institutional ones. I'll put it that way. Kai and Soledad. And I'm, I mean, listening to you, to you say that, I have to say too. I, 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 we were talking a little bit in the green room about the state of journalism and uh, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic and so forth. I, I actually think there is more and more distance from the institution in even. The, I mean, witness yourself uh, <laughs> in the uh, even in the large media companies more so than I've seen in my career. Um, and I think that's a hopeful thing. So that I mean, I think that is that, that's because I think the institutions, it seems to me, have learned that they're uh, that it is in their financial interest mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to have a multiplicity of voices that aren't uh, beholden to the institution. So that's my take on your yeah. job. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, you know, listen, I have the opposite situation, and I, I say quite honestly, you know, I feel blessed that, uh, to, you know, I work in public radio. Um, I've spent all of my career in um, community or independent media of some sort, and that comes with it with blessings and curses. You know, um, the blessing of it is that I do not have the situation that you're describing. I do not need to be in conflict with the institution. The institution is there to support me. Uh, and in public radio, it is really, I, I joke about it now, we have to go out and do the pledge drive where we ask for your money. Uh, <laughs> and I actually love it because I always, before I came to public radio, I'd always, I would go to panels like this and I would give the speech about how like, well, I don't, you know, don't tell my boss, but I work for my reader, I work for my listener, I don't work for who I work for. And now that is literally true. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 we, we, we ask you for money, so. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, th I think that's great, and that has been, it's, uh, that's, it's really been lovely. You know, the, the challenge then on the flip side of when you work outside of large media is that you have to work harder to find an audience. You have to work harder to be heard in the noise uh, of the ecosystem, and, you, and, that, um, and that's tough. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I, 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 have, I am still learning how to do that um, this many years into it. Um, Sometimes it's about your audience is not uh, all of the people that you would reach when you go on the air, but your audience is your peers and, your po and the policymakers and the people that you know that will hear you that will now say something different because they've heard you, you know? Um, so when uh, I was reporting on the foreclosure crisis, a, re a better example is when I was, you know, I started my career covering HIV. Um, and uh, in, uh, I was, this was in the mid 90s. Uh, so I was working for the Washington Blade, which is a gay newspaper in Washington, D.C. That's back when we had community newspapers that you printed and handed out. People read it. It was a thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and way old school. Way old school <laughs> it right? was a thing, I promise. All the kids here are Googling right. newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> really, really and truly, there was weekly newspapers and daily newspapers <laughs> and all kinds of nights and mornings. Anyway, uh, the, and I was covering HIV at the time when, uh, when protease inhibitors came. Uh, and death rates fell off the fell off a cliff, but not for black people. My, I was still watching my friends die, um, and um, and so for the next four years or so, I mean, I'm writing mostly, 
you know, I, I'm not reaching mass audiences, but I'm writing for people who care about public health, who care about HIV, who care uh, about this conversation to get them to say, hey, no, listen, it's, it's not over. You got to pay attention. And, and I feel like I, 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 not singularly, but I was part of a, a wave of community-based writers and thinkers who managed to turn the tide on that um, and get us to stop declaring the end of the epidemic. Um, by the time we got to the late 90s. So it's, it's sometimes the w it means orienting your work that way. Um, uh, uh, and sometimes it means uh, dealing with, you know, the, 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 beauty, the beauty of independent media, of public media, is you have these deeply loyal audiences. Um, the curse of that is that you have this very close relationship that makes it hard to get outside of the box of that relationship sometimes. You know, um, uh, certainly with the nation, I would argue we, we struggle with this at WNYC too, uh, of uh, trying to figure out how we're not just talking to our same people um, in the same way that we always talk to them uh, becomes a challenge. Um, but overall, I have to say, you know, I, d the, it, I have... I, I made the choice very early in my career that I was not going to pursue uh, a career in large media because I did not, I just didn't have the temperament um, for, uh, for, I didn't have the temperament for it um, to succeed at it. Uh, and that's, it comes with its pluses and negatives, but overall I think it has, I, I'm, 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 I'm happy of the choice and it's allowed me to do, I think, some very ambitious journalism. I never had a lot of butting heads um, throughout my career, most of my career was spent working for some big giant corporation. In fact, often I felt like the corporation sort of ignored us. When, I, when, when MSNBC started, people were absolutely panicked that MS, the Microsoft part of NBC, uh, of MSNBC, you know, that, that Bill Gates would call us. And I was doing a technology show. And I was like, oh my God, I wish Bill Gates would call in. Like, we'd love <laughs> to get him on the air. We can't get him to return our calls, actually. So the idea that Bill Gates is somehow like the puppeteer, and we're all, you know, it was just not true. But I do think there were certain things that made um, sort of pieces, parts of the corporation uncomfortable. So we did a documentary called Gary and Tony Have a Baby, and it was um, uh, following these two men who um, were married now, and then they wanted to have a baby that they had a, a legal or biological connection to. And so we followed their sort of path and having a surrogate, and part of their thing was going back to the Catholic Church where one of the men um, grew up, and having a, a really tough conversation with the priest because the priest, I, I think it was somewhere in Virginia, the priest basically would condemn anybody gay and they would go to him and say, but you know me, like you know us, we grew up in this church. How? And I remember the lawyer uh, at the time for CNN just said like, I feel very uncomfortable with them um, calling out the Catholic Church. I mean, I don't think it's, it's not exactly like breaking news, Catholic. <laughs> Listen, and I'm named for the Virgin Maria de la Soledad, right? Yeah. Named for the Virgin Mary. So I have a pretty good grasp on Catholicism. <laughs> and uh, this is not like the most amazing breaking news story that anybody's like, oh my, what? The priests are saying they don't support gay marriage. What? And, and I just remember the lawyer was absolutely adamant. We had to take it out of our documentary. They just, he was just like, and you could tell it was just for him personally, he just was not cool with it. And um, so often, you know, you could only fight so many fights and you're kind of like, all right, well, you know, we can take that out of the piece. Now that I, I run a production company, and I'm not sure if it's just five years have passed since I left CNN, um, but things are very different. First of all, we just, you, you tend to work with the people who, who like what you do and like your voice, so you kind of self-select out. Although now I, I, I still work for CNN doing projects. I still work for NBC doing projects. Um, so I think that um, you still are working for corporations, but it's with a, a different relationship. And, um, and I also think a lot of the people now that I work for, they, they come to you for an authentic voice. Like they, they actually don't want to squelch it. They're sort of like, here's what we need. We need authenticity. And I think some of that is that even in those five years, we've come a long way in how people think about storytelling. But for example, I remember my, one of my very last weeks at CNN, I was pitching a, a doc, I wanted to do a documentary on poverty in America because I thought that this idea that 
poor people, I mean, I really felt like a lot of our executives had this concept of poor people as like hobos with sticks and their little, you know, <laughs> truly. And I was like, you, 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 the, they don't look any different than we look, right? Like that's the, the it's, it, it was just such a disconnect. And it, it had, the conversation ended with someone telling me, ugh, nobody wants to see that. And, you know, and then as soon as you leave, suddenly people are like, so what kind of authentic stories can you tell <laughs> about <laughs> income inequality and da 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 no. So it's, uh, which I see really as a positive. Some, partly I'm just kind of on a different side of it and partly five years have passed and I think that those authentic stories have some value. But I do think it's really, I'm not even sure how much of it is the corporation and just that there's a certain amount of what allows people to get ahead is to kind of not, not stick out right like be daring but not so daring that it's damaging so everybody wants it all to be very like packaged and I'll, if i can i'll tell a story before i left cnn i was a storyteller of course <laughs> well we did it so so our very first black in america 2008 um i was at the tca the television critics association sitting on a stage like this talking about a documentary that was coming out and um, people ask me, it's all television critics, so tell me how you, how did you start thinking about the documentary? How long did you shoot for? How did you cast people? You know, basic questions. And uh, at the end, someone said, so what did you learn? I said, you know, I think the most interesting thing for me, this is 2008, was that whether you were talking to poor black people or middle class black people or really, really wealthy black people, they all had the same exact, practically, conversation with their children when it came to policing. Right, it all started there. When my son turned 13, occasionally daughter, but usually when my son turned 13, I sat him down and almost word for word, you could slice them all together. So um, I told the story that I thought it was just very interesting that this idea around policing for young, usually black boys um, was just a very different thing for black people. And I left the stage and the doc, you know, the writers went off to the next person. And my boss who was the He's really my boss's boss's boss. So he was the head of CNN Worldwide who'd come to this thing. And he said, that story's just not true. And I was like, I have just spent 18 <laughs> months <laughs> in this talk, like, what? And he said, you know, white parents have the same conversations with their children. And I said, you know, I don't think that's exactly right because I think that for white parents, it's like, don't be disrespectful. And for black parents, it's this is how you survive a confrontation with the police, yeah. right? I mean, and, and again, this is back in 2008. We've had a lot of those conversations, you know, in those 10 years since. But, and he literally said, it's just not true. You need to stop telling that story. Wow. And it just was, you know, so like, I don't know that that was the corporation. Right. I think it was just someone in power in the corporation who'd gotten to a certain level because he was able to navigate a lot of things. And he personally just felt really, really personally discomforted by this conversation and he just couldn't accept it. It's also on Twitter, if you're shooting, I can tell you. We put uh, <laughs> the whole thing on Twitter too. Um, because one day I was like, yeah, screw it, I'm just gonna tell the story anyway. And <laughs> I, I told it. Um, but I, I don't know how much of it is, a, is like, I don't think Time Warner had right. a conversation about it. I think it was just executives, frankly, who had bias and they were just gonna show their bias. Or is it so both, right? I mean, if, you know, because Yes, corporations are people, I suppose, <laughs> but like they're actually collections of people that are structured to let to promote that guy yeah. to those decision making roles and such that the people at the top, I mean this I mean this is a question because I've not worked at a corporation, <laughs> that, but that the people at the top, the people that rise to the top of the organization reflect that organization's yep. values. Yeah. Organization. yeah, although there's a lot in the day to day, that decision I don't, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody, frankly, of the people I knew at Time Warner, I'm not sure that they would tell you never to say it. I think they would all pat your hand and be like, oh, honey, yeah, yeah. girl. You know, <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but I mean, his, like to have someone say, never tell that story again, <laughs> is kind of like kind a of really interesting thing to do. So, so I don't know, I think it's a combination because it really was his own personal feeling about something that he just felt was not true and he would not have somebody who was representing the company say something that he felt was not true. But I bet if you went into a board meeting with all of the board, they all probably would agree with him, right? Yeah, you know, I don't, I still or don't think any of them would say, don't so say tell it. her she can't <laughs> yeah. say it. I right. think they'd be like, they'd well, you know, Soledad, yeah. <laughs> this project has been. 
Well, nothing so, like an empowered black lady to annoy <laughs> everybody in the company. <laughs> but I don't think they would have told me to shut up. So uncomfortable conversations. This sort of let's pivot to art. Um, and you know, I I've looked at all of your work, and there's there is an artistic quality to it. There's a point of view, um, but there are also limits to the amount of punch that you can put into your work. And I've s we've all now seen the Carol Walker piece, 40 feet. And if you've been to the Montclair Art Museum, you know that this is a very, very powerful um, work of art to walk into. It's 40 feet and it's curved. Um, and within it, I was um, with Tara last week. Um, and she looked at it, and I believe she mentioned this in her talk, that what she saw in one segment of the, of the mural was Tamir Rice. Um, and if you go back to it, I don't think we have, we're, we're going to be able to project it, but you have one segment, there are 17 figures overall on it. In one segment, there are two little boys, one with a pop gun and one with a rifle. And the rifle is in, and one is phenotypically black, and he has a rifle actually in his mouth, and the other one is phenotypically white, um, and the pop gun is just sort of, even the pop in itself is like lame. And the black child um, has just shot himself in the mouth, and the, um, it's very graphic and very powerful. And um, so I wanted to talk about the power of art to actually break through the kind of civility limits um, that are imposed on you or could be imposed on you in your work, um, but what you see when you, and I've sent you the image, and, and um, how you think those images and the relevance of art to trying to get out this new and different, or the old narrative, but a more powerful way. I think art's really powerful, whether it's graphic de depictions or, you know, it's one of the things I liked about documentaries, right, is that you just had the time, things that you couldn't cover quickly. You want to show violence, you can camp out, and really what always made violence scary to me was that the people weren't crazy, they were regular people, right? Mm -hmm. That always made racists scary to me was that they were working in the supermarket. They you know, they, y in your mind, you think, like, these are the boogeymen, but actually they're just regular people living their lives. I mean, I think of late that they sort of opened it up to people feeling very free to spout whatever racial craziness they, they're feeling. Um, so I think art does have this You're being diplomatic there. What did you want to say? <laughs> <laughs> Racist crap, I guess, is what I was looking for. Um, but, you know, I, I think art has this opportunity to... Um, to show you, right? It's always the juxtaposition. You put this with this, and it kind of is what, what's jarring and, and shocks people. And I, I, that's really what I always liked in, in documentaries. I did a doc on a guy, a Latino in America doc, guy, it was Joe Miller. And I remember interviewing him. Every morning he would get up and hang the American flag, the U.S. Marine flag, and the Confederate flag in his house. He lives in um, Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. Shenandoah is a mile square. And his goal, he would tell you, his stated goal, he is going to run Latinos out of Shenandoah. Pennsylvania. He don't like Latinos. And <laughs> I remember, clearly, and I remember interviewing him and I said, so, you know, like, wow, that's what happened. Like, why do you, we're not like Latinos? He said, well, they steal people's jobs. I said, oh my gosh, well, tell me about the job. Someone obviously stole your job. What happened? He's like, oh, no one stole my job. I'm like, oh, okay, that, that's weird. When clearly you have a good, fr you're so <laughs> emotional about this and you have a kind of a evil mission. Tell me about your, <laughs> clearly you have a friend who had their job stolen. And he's like, I don't have a friend. I said, so, so who are we talking about? Who had their job stolen? And he looks at me and he goes, the blacks. And I literally went, because <laughs> he spent the morning hanging the Confederate flag on his house. I'm like, so, so Joe Miller is supporting the blacks in the town, <laughs> of which there are like 10 in Shenandoah. You know, and, it just was, and, and I don't know that you could kind of get to that if you didn't see it unfold in an interview. And I think that opportunity exists in, in, in art, in, in graphic art, in documentary, any kind of thing where people can sort of see it better than I could tell it. That, I think, is what the power is. What, what, what I take from Kara Walker, I've always taken from Kara Walker, is, you know, this, uh, is this haunting, you know, um, that we as a society and a culture, we are haunted by our sins um, and we're haunted by white supremacy. Uh, and it's, and that's, that is over and over again what comes out in her work to me um, is the specters 
uh, that swirl around us, um, and these, we had an exchange this morning about, I wanted to call it demonic, you were right to point out that it's not quite demonic, because you can cast a demon out, this is more, this is more basic to who we are, I don't know if, can we cast it out or not, um, but there's this, these, these ghosts, uh, of, of the, of, of, of the society we've built, that are, they're, they're in our society, these ghosts, and they haunt us, um, and she communicates that when you walk into a room of her work, you're, you're in, you are with, you are among those ghosts. Um, uh, and uh, that medium, uh, I don't know that anybody in any medium can do it as well as Kara Walker is doing it. Um, uh, like Solid, and I think, you know, we, uh, the way we attempt to do it, what's very important to our work uh, on uh, There Goes a Neighborhood, on the United States Anxiety, on all of the podcasting work we do at WNYC is that we are very, we're trying to be rooted in history. Um, and so, you know, I, this season, uh, in course of covering the midterm elections, a political story for us was that I went to Montgomery, Alabama to visit the opening of the lynching memorial. If anyone who has not been, it should, it, it, you should go, you must go. Um, and it's a very similar experience to walking into a piece of Carol Walker's art, you know, where you walk into, you go up this hill uh, and there's uh, these, th all, there's these rusted pillars hanging above you uh, and you're walking through, and each pillar represents a county and on each county's pillar there are the names of the people that they've documented to be lynched, etched onto those pillars. And so you've got hundreds of pillars and thousands of names and you're walking amongst them. Uh, uh, and that is how the history haunts us, you know. And so in, in talking about politics, we felt it was important to go there to have a conversation about the midterm elections because that haunts this. Um, and I think that's how we approximate what Carol Walker's doing, but I don't think anyone, you, there, we all use the mediums that we have, uh, uh, but this, that, that, that haunting in our society, I think she, the, her work is singular in being able to, to, to bring us to it. Well, you know, and, and it's, it's interesting that you started with ghosts, because that's, that's kind of what I was going to say as well, is that, you know, I, I used to go to Art Basel every year, go back down to Florida to, to try to get, um, we used to do it at the GRIA, we would just cover Art Basel, the route would cover it every year. We wanted to try to interest the network in covering art because I, 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 I think I said it to one of the young men who did a little, I did a little TV thing or a little school TV thing before we came in here, that there was a time when the visual arts, particularly the black visual arts, were very much incorporated into the mainstream culture of black America. You think of the Harlem Renaissance, these weren't distant sort of elite figures, this was part of the everyday kind of, you know, recipe for day-to-day -day life, art and literature were m much more incorporated in music and jazz. And we sort of placed art on a pedestal where I don't think it ought to be. I think the, the average person should be accessing this work because it really is a narrative um, uh, about ourselves. Um, Stan Lee just died, right? And what are comics but art, right? It's a way that art translates <clears throat> into really everyday narratives. And when you think about the way that the American narrative has always been told, it's always been a heroic narrative. So America is Captain America and Superman. We're never Lex Luthor. We're the good guy. We're always the good guy. And it's been very difficult, particularly for white America, to shake that heroic narrative and accept the villainy in our own history. Black Americans get it. Brown Americans, Native Americans, we get it, right? We know that this country has quite often been the villain. This idea that, good God, racism has sprung up because of Donald Trump. Well, we know that's absurd, right? This country was founded on the fundamental narrative that to be free, white, and male was the one kind of citizenship, and everything else was below that, right? We live in a country where, you know, white men founded it for themselves, for their own liberty, and then stated that even when they begrudgingly were willing to give their black male enslaved the right to vote, it took 50 more years to give to their own wives, right? So the idea of, 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 you know, of disinheriting people from citizenship, that's actually the main narrative of the United States. We've had 40 years of forced civility where people were forced to be politically correct, which a lot of white Americans now interpret as unfairness. That if I can't say the N word, if I can't do the uh, what the Hitler salute as these kids at uh, Barabo, Barabu High School did in Wisconsin, of all places, well, if we can't do that, if these poor young men are going to be persecuted for merely throwing up a Hitler salute, that's unfair. 
that if a guy you know, tries to rape a girl when he's 17 and you bring it up when he wants a permanent seat on the Supreme Court, well, that's unfair because he was a mere child. Well, Tamara Ice was a kid, right? Trayvon Martin was a kid. And so the same people who say, well, that, well, you know, Trayvon Martin was a man, say that Brett Kavanaugh was a boy, right? So I, I, what I, when I see that, that narrative um, of what Kara Walker is doing is she is showing you ghosts and she's showing you the ghosts of lynching victims. And, you know, three years ago in 2015, I covered a lyn uh, an alleged lynching in Mississippi. That's like three years ago. In this January, there was a hanging that the family is dead sure is a lynching. There have been at least two or three mysterious deaths of Ferguson protesters that their families are pretty sure is a lynching. Missouri isn't represented as the Deep South. It's got the largest Klan population, current membership in the Ku Klux Klan. Missouri, not Mississippi. Mississippi, 37% African-American state. The most African-Americans by percentage, 1.9 million souls, uh, more than any other state. Um, and then the only territories with higher percentages of black people would be the U.S. Virgin Islands and D.C. has the current sitting senator who just said 48 hours ago about a supporter that if he invited me to be at the front row of a hanging, I'd be in, I'd be in the front row. If he invited me to a public hanging, I'd be in the front row. And she called that just an over-exuberant expression of regard, which is a very, um, it's a very Southern way, right, yes. of recharacterizing with very flowery language. Um, blatant racism, laughing about lynching. And everybody she said that to laughed. Luckily, the person who videotaped it actually thought it was outrageous and put it up on social media. That was like 48 hours ago, right? Um, a lot of people believe that a lot of these killings, that the Trayvon Martin case, were lynchings. Because what was lynching? It was an individual, a group of individuals who felt they had the right to take criminal justice into their own hands and kill a person, a man or a woman, just because they wanted to and because they could. That's happening like all the time. But it's back to what you said, which is that because there's a sense of like, and you hear it a lot, you know, America's better than that. This is the true America, yeah. right? Somebody does something good and they say, now that, <laughs> that person <laughs> carrying America. that puppy yeah. out of the whatever, that's the real America. Yeah. And I, I, I'm always sort of, I find just calling certain things real America and other things not real America yeah. is very uncomfortable for me. But, but it's this just absolute desire to have the, the sense of America as this heroic story, forgetting kind of any sort of history, this just very clean, amazing, heroic story yep. that everybody just follows along. And it, it, it's, it, it's very, very problematic. And, and, and I think um, now it's sort of coming apart right at the seams, Absolutely. especially as it intersects with this time where people feel very free to fly their sort of racist Which is flag. restoration, right? I mean, I remember when I was, when the first book I read, I did a lot of listening to old, TV footage of interviews in the Deep South. People used to come out and say very, the N word just openly to a TV reporter. Right. This wasn't like controversial to be racist. It's actually normal. You know, I, I think it's interesting that we're now re-representing, as you said, you know, open racism and incivility as somehow abnormal. It's just the status quo ante. You know, it's, I don't see how it's abnormal at all. The, the piece in history that we just have skipped over too much, I think currently is the Reagan revolution. Because the reality, we lose, I am 45 years old. My parents grew up in Jim Crow. My parents could not sit on this stage. Yeah. You know, like, and that is so near. That is so, so near. And we treat it as this distant history. Yeah. And it is so no need. And the reason we treat it as the distant history is because the key, the core success of the Reagan revolution was to wash away the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and to create the notion of colorblindness and to say, okay, that is done. We have succeeded. Right. We are all now equal. Racial justice looks like, we don't say racial justice, but the, the absence of racism looks like being colorblind. And that became a mainstream idea that was actively, it was thought up by people. It didn't just grow out of the ether. People thought it up developed a campaign for talking about it, moved it through the culture, moved it through the politics, and it became a mainstream idea such that by the time I was in high school, the people, well-meaning people, the thing to, if you were really, if you were trying to do right, you know, you said, listen, I don't see race. I'm colorblind, I don't see race. I don't see it. And that was black and white, not mm -hmm. just white people, well-meaning people. That was the success of the Reagan revolution. And so it has given us this historical amnesia such that we would think that the voting, the, the relevance of the Voting Rights Act, such that the Supreme Court could arrive right. 
to a point of saying, literally saying straight face that race does not, the legal ruling was that race does not impact elections in America. And some of that is because reporters, I think today, Absolutely. also don't bother to tell stories with context, mm -hmm. right? There was just the federal housing law, but not sort of how it was unequally applied, right? So you just don't get any context on stories. So it, of course you would think that everything's hunky-dory and has been, because there's no background on stories. So then the people who Our are complaining, those hours. angry yeah. you know, people who are complaining that, that they've been left out, they're just not really working as hard as everybody else, right? Well, because but is it because just the reporters? I mean, um, our, I mean, our culture is, uh, there are message carriers all throughout our culture. There are reporters, there's how people, how people are educators, uh, educated. Um, there is, uh, everyone is carrying some form of this myth. There are politicians yeah. who well. will say, say, well, our founders all agreed that all of us, I'm thinking like, well, Oh, I know, that's my favorite. All of us are created equal. Like literally, no, yeah. right. literally. <laughs> like, literally well, that wasn't seriously, true. that not didn't happen. No. And, and I think but they don't get, no one gets called on that. No one gets called on. And I think it's partly because of the, the Reporters, thing that, that's their job, right? That's yeah. what I'm saying. It's but it's also educators our job. job. It's also educators' job. I mean, you think about this sort of civic institution designed to make all of you into good citizens are our schools. And our schools are glossing over history. I taught um, a, a race, gender, and media class to see juniors and seniors, really brilliant, smart kids who had not seen a lynching photo. And so what I would show them, the real version of the Kara Walker photo, the lynching photo, and I, actually what I would tell them is, don't even look at the bodies. Look, look at, at the, the people smiling. around them. They right. were ordinary people who then went off to church and were everyone's were friendly and normal. It was a postcard, right? Those photos. And people are took postcards. tchotchkes home. They took a nose and ear. I mean, a finger. They did that. Mm -hmm. And they had there are people with artifacts of a human body in their homes that they passed down from generation to generation. This was perfectly normal to a lot of people. And I think that because we don't want to teach a history that doesn't create good citizens, Americans are really. If you go to Europe. Your average European knows more about American lynching and American racial history than often an American does because they get raw, unfiltered history. We get this filtered thing that if it is designed to create good citizenship, then how come only four in ten of us vote? It isn't working because we don't even vote, <laughs> right? So it's like it's not working. If it's designed to create good citizens, we should have 80 or 90 percent civic participation instead of 50 percent. I guess the reason so I... So we could, we could go on for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> you think? <laughs> <and> <laughs> And I'm getting the sign here. <laughs> are you getting the Are you getting the wrap? Rap, rap. I've, I've, got, rap. I've gotten the wrap. I've gotten the neck. I've gotten, I've gotten <laughs> the all hook. of it over here. And we want to at least allow a little bit of time, a very short amount of time, for for some questions uh, for the audience before we really wrap this up. Um, you guys have like water with Montclair State University oh. on it. Right? I was admiring I'm that. I'm really well. impressed. It's amazing. It's amazing. In the game. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> So we have one over here. We've got a lady back there too, in the red hat. Oh, it's nice to see Oh my God, everybody. there are people all up there I too. Know. Wow. Hi, people hey. up in the top. Hi, uh, Hi top people. Uh, a little question okay. from the top. Okay, so wow. this is what Steve Colbert feels like, right? When he just wakes <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, hello. Hi, Soledad. Hi. Feliciano. Hey, how Feliciano. Doing? How are you? Uh, I'm great. How are you? How Good. are you? We still work together. <laughs> just catching up. <laughs> and also, hi, uh, Joanne. You don't know this, but I, I'm also a Montbello warrior. Are you a Montbello warrior? And, what? And I worked my with high you school. for a long time. That's at, at awesome. NBC. Anyway, um, wonderful panel. I really enjoyed it. What I'm more interested in, though, is what you were touching on um, as far as like the future of media and um, inclusive representation. It's very splintered um, right now. Uh, Companies are panicking, trying to find out where the audiences are going. Um, there's so many options, but now we have some great opportunity, in my opinion. I feel optimistic in a lot of ways, but it's also hard because there's a status quo. You are selling cable subscriptions or, you know, whatever. So, um, so just, you know, I want your thoughts on, on, on I, want, I want to be in that green room. I want to find out more about how you feel about whether you're optimistic in the direction of representation overall media. Uh, I guess I'm optimistic, but not necessarily short term, right? I think right now journalism is trying to figure it out. I mean, if you look at a lot of, um, CNN's a great example of a model where the talking head thing is just inexpensive, right? To not have context is actually a, a, a really good value because reporting costs money, sending people out in the field, tape, that's very expensive. So I think in the short term, this 17 people on a panel yelling at each other, which is I find so stressful, I've literally, 
said with love, have a really hard time watching the oh, MSNBC we we morning on, show. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to yell. Oh my them. God, they just, they it's like, it. I want to have a cocktail and a yeah, cigarette before I head out the <laughs> door. <laughs> at 7.30 in the morning. They, 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 they had like 14 people. You could people. not get the whole panel people. on the screen. And a hologram. So There's also a hologram sometimes. So then you're de facto saying you're not you're not going to have context, right? Because everyone's going to jump in. They're going to jump in for 22 seconds. So I actually think that 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 model's gonna change. It's just not gonna work, partly because the ratings are going like this. It's just not gonna work. It, you can do it sort of for a while, and one of the reasons Donald Trump is sort of center stage is because he's a money maker, right? You can't really kill the goose that lays the golden egg. You have to put him on TV. You can put him on TV to yell at him. You can put him on TV to praise him, but you can't say we're not gonna cover him. It's, it's problematic to the financial model. So I think that the financial model is going to, at some point, maybe not in the next two years, uh, change dramatically and I think because the country is just more diverse people are going to sort of go other places for their news and you'll see something else come out of that and everybody's trying to figure out what that is right now. C can I just really quickly say that I, I So I mean here's what here's what I'm going to have to do. Yeah, oh make no really short one because yeah. we, we're we're in the lightning round now. Okay, lightning round. Never mind. Sorry. Never mind. I did <laughs> such a bad job on later. the lightning <laughs> round. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. So we're going to try to get as many Quick, okay. as, as Sorry, many I'll answer faster possible. next time. There's a lady in the red hat right there. Firm but fair, we like that. Hi, I just wanted, what has come up for me and why I was very interested in attending this tonight, I was listening to a program on NYC on NPR. Ma'am, we are in the lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> and said and with love, but okay, we are in the right. lightning fair. round. But what it is is, this gentleman had written a book about, his, uh, about uh, heroes during uh, the Nixon era. And the one thing I found very striking, no one remembers the gentleman who discovered the wire and caused the whole furor with the Watergate situation. The man died, no one cared, they never hired him again. And he was not looked at as a hero. In fact, I don't think anyone even thinks about the fact that had that gentleman not found that wire, we'd have a different story to tell regarding Watergate. So it's, it's interesting when you're talking about history. I come from a period of time when you were, you had to remember, you were taught to remember. And with all of this 24 hour news bites, that's the problem I'm finding people not really using their memories, you know, to really get at the context of things. Mm -hmm. So that's all I wanted to okay. share. Right. Point. Thank you. Next person. Thank you. Next person. Hi guys, hi Soledad, hi Joy, how are you? Kai, hi. I support your NPR all the time. Thank you. So <laughs> my quick question was, um, as the mother what of a I teenage- What am I, Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> I gave you- Jim, I gave you a kiss before, That's stop it. it. Uh, <laughs> um, so anyway, so as a mother of a teenage daughter who came to me the night that, well, the morning that Donald Trump was elected and said, Mommy, you said this wasn't going to happen. You said this wasn't going to happen. She should have called um, me. I would have told her it was right, definitely Right, well, happening. Nancy Pelosi told me two months earlier, and I told her, I, I tried to reassure her in a TV studio. That's a whole other story. Yeah. But anyway, um, of course, I was wrong. So what, like, my daughter's really interested in speaking out and just learning more. So as three amazing journalists, what advice would you give for young people who are interested in like, following your paths? What advice would you give? Just use whatever platform you have and believe what you see. And this is what I used to tell my students is what you think is happening is happening. And one of the, uh, mo the things you learn about authoritarian societies is that A, people just simply capitulate to it and accept it. Most of the time it isn't convulsive, it just becomes normal. If you ever been to Cuba, people walk around, go to school, go to church, do what they gotta do. No one's like in constant <laughs> convulsion. So you really have to be vigilant. There's nothing inevitable about America being a democracy. I hate to be negative, but there's absolutely nothing Bridge. inevitable about it. There are countries that were just democracies who were sliding back into fascism. Italy, Poland, Hungary, um, Turkey, it was, a, it was a democracy. So the reality is, believe when you see it. You're gonna see things that you're gonna think, wait, this is crazy. No, it's real. There is real autocracy and authoritarianism happening. It's happening now. Believe what you see. Just tell young people who are very sharp, don't let anyone talk you out of what you're seeing being real. It is real and it is frightening. And she should learn how to do research.
right? She needs to learn how to do research. I think young people really need to learn how to express themselves in their writing, in their speaking. No one's going to take you seriously if you can't show a body of work where you can make an argument and have that argument rely on facts in some way, shape, or form. You can't just scream, oh my god, it's authoritarian. You have to be able to say, exhibit A, exhibit B, yep. exhibit C, and, and here's my argument. And, you know, I always tell people, write and read. Write, 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 so you can learn to express yourself. Amen. I have anything to add to that. It was all perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, two more questions. My question back here. First of all, let me say thank you very much. And my question is this, that it's true that the cycle of news that we're getting now is just like vegetating, vegetating, vegetating. So you really have to be mindful of the stuff that's coming at you and that you get it from other sources. I like the fact that Soledad does documentaries, and the one I'd like to see done is on education. Where our books come from. The state of Texas is the state that generates a lot of the school books that our kids are learning from. And from those books, a lot of information is not in there. So that's something we need to look at as people and try to get all the information in the books. That's just a response that I have. You make a great point. I mean, you know, who, 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 who's covering the caravan tonight? Nobody, right? Nobody. So you have a lot of coverage that's around the clock, crazy, frothy coverage that at the end of the day is just completely politically motivated around a midterm election when things like education could be valuable and useful for, for reporters to be chasing. I mean, I don't like to diss reporters, but I think there's so many missed opportunities and so many chasing of your tail you know, because that's what everybody's talking about, and, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's wasted. It's an absolute wasted opportunity. One more hi. question. Hi, yeah, I'm over here. <laughs> oh. Um, oh. Hi, great to <laughs> see you guys. Um, I love you, Joy, you're wonderful. Um, <laughs> both all are. But um, I have a, I just wanted to say, in terms of education, like the woman over there mentioned, I have an interracial son. His father's from, originally from West Africa, and uh, we found out he was doing a, a research project, I think, in high school, um, early high school, about um, you know sl history of slavery and all that. And we we go up to the Berkshires frequently up in Massachusetts, and we found out about um, a friend of ours told us about um, Elizabeth Freeman and her amazing story. And uh, you know, then he started telling his teachers about her, and uh, they never heard of her. They never knew about her. And she's just she's an amazing. I don't know if you have, if she's known as Mumbet. She was one of the first slaves in, to be freed because she, she uh, heard her, uh, she's, um, she heard her, uh, her master um, talking about the fact that all men are created equal. And she said, well, I should be too. So then she filed a lawsuit and, um, and one um, was uh, the ancestor of an actress that, whose name is not coming to me right now. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was, uh, it was an, thank you, yes. The Cedric family, yes. So, um, it's Kira Cedric. So, yeah, it was just, uh, it's just, and he's, you know, he, even now he's you know, he, living in New Jersey, he's experienced some um, weird in racial injustice. And, you know, I've seen it myself, even as a white Jewish woman, you know, I've seen, I, I'm and, more and sensitive so to it. We, so, your question for the panel. I just was making a comment okay. oh. that, uh, <laughs> that it's just really interesting, <laughs> you know, right that, I, that, I, that I can kind yes. of. One more question. I don't want to cut, cut you off, but no, that's we are okay, in I'm the lightning done. round. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> but thank you for that contribution. One mic. last question. Up here in the, oh, okay. up, the up in the back. You're going to have to yell. Oh, yeah, what about the top people? Brooklyn! Yes! Brooklyn! <laughs> no, we need a question. We have questions. No comment. Here, I don't have so, a comment. On. What's that? I'm going to turn this comment into a question. Go ahead. Okay. Well, you and your family want to marry? Yes. Mm -hmm. I told you I was Catholic. <laughs> I <laughs> so my dad was a professor at SUNY Stony Brook. Yes, thank you. I think nice this young lady has a question. Like okay, we have one more question. This right has here. to be a real question. It has to be a real question, though. Cause, cause a robot. Put the mics in your mouth. A robot was on in China on the news. Has, what do you have to say about that? The what AI, a robot giving the news? The a AI. robot. They have a new the AI, AI news. The yeah. AI news. You don't need a robot. You can actually. No, no, no. Sinclair. The, 
But right? what, Sinclair, right? this right? is... Honestly, I'm not even being, I'm we not being sarcastic. Here. No, 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 no. You, this you don't is need the to future. create an AI robot. You literally could have an actual Correct. person give them a script and Correct. tell them what to say. Yeah. Like, and they do, in fact. Yeah. Which yes. they do. Thing. Yes. So, I, you know. All right, so now I'm that is going to have to be the last <laughs> question. <laughs> and, thank and you for your question. Thank you, thank you for your so comment. Much. So here's, so here's the thing. Um, we have had a tremendous evening um, because of the collaboration between the Montclair Art Museum. Um, go see the Carol Walker exhibit. Montclair State University. Who thought that we had this jewel right here and we could attract this sort of talent? And the Marshall Project. That combination is the sort of thing that we need to see in so many different ways, uh, trying to get the word out, trying to change this very troubled uh, world that we're in right now and push it forward. Now, let's clap it up for our phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal panel. So did that Abrarian, to our you. lead, Kai Wright. Thank you, guys. Okay, Thank you very call. much. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, we're going to take a picture. Ready? we got to get us up. Come on in. Come on in, Keith. <laughs> Yay! Here we go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Beautiful. Fantastic. Nice that was That's really fantastic. fun. That oh, was no, so we much fun. Closer. Okay, I'm going to make one. I'm going to do one. Ready? Selfie. Okay, you got to get it.